right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gabrowski, and I'll be your host for today. If you've been tuning in this month, you know our theme is exploring STEM careers. So uh, we've been bouncing around the world, talking to different STEM pro professionals, learning a bit more uh, about their careers, and uh, you know how students can get involved as well. So we've got a great session in store for today. I'm really excited today to be connecting for the first time uh, with Tracy Fanara. She is an environmental engineer, uh, a scientist, public speaker, and television host working to extend humanity's existence on Earth through innovative, collaborative solutions uh, on world health threats, as well as looking for ways to build a sustainable future uh, for upcoming generations. So she's currently a coastal modeling manager with the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, um, where she works on coastal uh, ocean modeling efforts to try and gain a better understanding of our Earth systems and threats to human life. So you may have seen Tracy on TV in a number of different ways, perhaps on Mythbusters, The Search, maybe the Science Channel, the Weather Channel, Fox or CBS, all kinds of uh, spots where Tracy has appeared to share STEM as well as science communication. So I'm gonna bring Tracy in live with us now. Hey Tracy, how are you doing today? Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. All right, awesome. Well, we have a great group of classrooms joining us from across North America, Canada, uh, the U.S., even Mexico. Uh, we also have a great crew tuning in via YouTube. So shout out to that crew. Uh, use the chat sidebar. Let us know where you're tuning in from and let's see some questions coming in uh, for Tracy. But Tracy, that's enough uh, for me right now. Let's uh, let you take over for a little bit. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Tracy Panara. I'm an environmental engineer. And, and as Joe said, I am the Coastal Modeling Manager for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It's it's NOAA for short, which you might have heard of that. We're way cooler than NASA. We just don't have as many T-shirts. Um, so what I do is modeling. It sounds boring, right? But modeling is basically like computer games, except for Earth systems so that we can understand how everything on Earth affects each other so that we can better understand how to protect human lives and and economies and wildlife and everything like that. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, Tracy, I'll just get you to switch. There should be a display settings at the top. We see the presenter view. I think if you if you do a swap there for us. Ah, yep. There we go. We're good. Perfect. Okay. So I, this is kind of a broad presentation just to show you kind of my my crazy journey through my career. And it, it, it's definitely not typical. I, I made my own path and I will be encouraging each of you to do the same. So we think back to, you know, kind of those moments in our lives and you might be having them right now and your teacher might be inspiring you to go on a certain path right now. But for me, I was in fourth grade when I learned about a hazardous waste dump site where industries were dumping toxins into canalways. And those toxins were seeping into the groundwater and the soil. And then people started building houses and schools on that soil. And there were birth defects and cancers. And, and it, was, it was pretty devastating. And, and it made me realize this, this incident happened right down the street from where I lived and I had no idea made me realize that everything in this world is connected. What we put into the environment eventually comes back to affect our health. And this incident also started the Environmental Protection Agency or the EPA's Superfund program, which is a program where the government is determined to clean up some of these hazardous waste sites to protect public health. So it was really this moment when, when I learned what passion was, I learned that unsafe drinking water was a leading killer among children worldwide, something that we completely take for granted. We just turn on our faucet and we can trust that we can drink that water. This was killing kids. And I was, 
I was all of a sudden inspired to do something. I wanted to do something, whether I was paid for it or not. And that's when you realize that you find your passion. And, you know, finding your passion is not, it's not common. It's something that you have to search for. And it's something that you have to go outside your comfort zone and your box and, and meet new people and experience new things to actually find. Because so few people find what they're truly passionate about. And I got lucky. So I, I was going into college and um, actually uh, my, my road to college was, was uh, quite a journey in itself. And, and I can explain that later. But um, I heard about this, this, this discipline, the scientific discipline, which I had never heard of before, where I can provide people clean drinking water and clean air and protect people from natural disasters and still design and build things. And I was like, sign me up. I want to be a superhero. So I became an environmental engineer and I was going to find world problems and solve them through principles of science, which all sounds a lot easier than it actually is when you get out into the real world. But anything easy? probably it isn't what you should be doing. Anything worth anything is going to give you some obstacles to overcome. And I had a lot of obstacles going into Florida, graduating with a PhD and, and dealing with all of these Florida problems. Now, what you're seeing in this top, in the top right is, is called cyanobacteria. Now, this is a worldwide problem. It's a freshwater species. What you're seeing in the left hand is called Florida red tide. It's a marine species. Now, some cyanobacteria species are harmful and they release a toxin and Florida red tide also releases a toxin. So these things that happen in Florida are a threat to public health, wildlife and economy. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. Upon graduating and, and starting to figure out what I was going to do with with all this passion and, and these degrees, um, I realized that that being a silent superhero sitting in the background and, and you know, making sure everybody has clean water, even though they don't know about it and letting them, you know, still take it for granted, it, it's great, but, but we have to do more. I started realizing that my friends were throwing trash out their car window and I would ask them where they thought it went they 100% of the time either didn't know or thought it went to a wastewater treatment plant, like somebody was cleaning it up for them. Um, when in fact, every single drop of rain that lands on the state of Florida brings everything that lands on the ground to our natural water bodies and becomes part of the ecosystem and eventually part of our drinking water because of how the water cycle works. So I got all three of my degrees from the great University of Florida, BS, ME, and PhD. And that's because I really, I'm so proud to be a Florida Gator. My college was amazing. So I took a job right out of college and it, this was my lowest paying job I was offered. And the reason why I took it is because this nonprofit institute was going to let me do research, scientific research, but also communication. I was going to be able to tell people about science and and educate people so that we can, you know, grow as a society to better protect environment for future generations. And I was like, yes, but really that just means that you have two full-time jobs. But but it was okay because I loved it. I absolutely loved it. But I was the only engineer and a whole group of, of scientists. These were mostly marine biologists. And, and I wanted to be a marine biologist in high school. And then I, I did an internship at an aquarium. And all I did was uh, clean up sea lion snot from walls and stuff dead fish with vitamins. And then I changed my mind. Um, but, but to be back in marine biology was, was pretty cool in being an engineer and having a different perspective. It was really important because Scientists, they really monitor and they they theorize and they they find out what's going on. But engineering is application. It's finding solutions to problems. And you need the two to be effective. 
And that's why diversity of scientific backgrounds always creates the best team possible to, to handle a problem or a project. So my first job at Mount Marine Laboratory was to do something about something called Florida red tide or Karenia brevis. Now this is a microscopic species that lives in the Gulf of Mexico. It's super tiny, but in really, really big numbers, it can be problematic. This marine species releases a toxin that harms aquatic life. But what's so special about it is that this species the toxin can actually attach onto sea salt particles in the air. Basically, it goes from the water to the air and then people breathe it in and it makes them cough and sneeze. But for people with asthma, this can be really serious. So we had to do something to alert the public of where these effects are to protect them. We also have another problem in Florida and, and that's called cyanobacteria. Now you might've seen in your life, a really thick green paste on top of a, a pond. And that's that's cyanobacteria. When there's a lot of nutrients from dog poop or fertilizer or agriculture or natural sources, that extra nutrients causes these algae to grow like crazy. So you think that nutrients would be a good thing, right? But sometimes too much of a good thing is not so good, just like chocolate cake. So this is, um, actually, we're gonna skip this for now, I think. Oh, In the late 19th no, we century, won't. settlers came down to South Florida to realize that the land that- So this is basically the story of Central Florida and, and a problem that, um, that I had to deal with in my job at Mount Marine Laboratory. They purchased was swamp land. They needed to build houses and farm they realized that a huge lake in the middle of the state drained down into the Everglades and then out into the ocean. And they realized that putting a big dam on the south part of this lake would allow the land to dry so they can start using it. So that's what they did. In 1928, a hurricane event came, broke the dam, and thousands of people lost their lives. The Army Corps of Engineers was called in to fix the problem, and that they did. So now, when that water gets to a certain water level, it is released to the Caloosahatchee River on the west and the St. Lucie River on the east. Lake Okeechobee is known for its annual cyanobacteria blooms from legacy nutrients within the lake, but also from the high amount of nutrients flowing to the lake from agriculture, urban, and residential developments. In June 2018, Water was released with a cyanobacteria bloom to the Caloosahatchee River, filling the river and canalways where people live and going out to the Gulf of Mexico where there was an existing Florida red tide bloom present. Florida declared a state of emergency. So at this time, I was one of the leading experts for this, for this Florida water crisis. And there were so many news articles and I realized that communication was probably one of the most important parts of being a scientist. It was so important to communicate to people what was going on so that they can, they can protect themselves. And so while all this was going on, you have a choice whether to sit back and, and not say anything, not stand up for, for what's true because there was so much misinformation or you can put yourself out there and, and try to correct the misinformation. And, and that's what I chose to do. And it was, it was a tough decision, but you have to realize, and, and I know you guys are, a lot of you kids are, are young right now, but it's important that you, when you find your passion, what you, when you find what you believe in, that you speak up because every time we ignore something that's not true or you don't stand up for what you believe in and, or avoid the truth because, because of the implications involved, we lose and we lose the opportunity to enhance environmental literacy or how people understand how the world work. We, 
lose the chance of a domino effect of change behavior. We lose the opportunity to give future generations a better world. And we allow the disconnect between scientists and the public to grow. Now, that disconnect between scientists and the public is something that, that I really work hard to combat. And, and I've learned some, some tools that have really worked well. Um, teaching people, including them in scientific research and empowering people and, and kids to get involved. And so I developed a, a website and smartphone app to alert the public of where the effects of Florida red tide are. Well, I redeveloped this and I developed a, a citizen science reporting app so that anybody from anywhere can report environmental hazards so that everybody can see it on the public map. And that's called CSIC. I developed a number of different citizen science projects to get kids and the public involved in science to get them to monitor Florida red tide, these toxic algae or nutrients, looking at bivalves to see if like oysters, clams, mussels, to see if they can filter out this toxic species of algae in our waterways. And then I was approached by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to apply for a job. And this was really tough because I loved my job. I loved my job at Moat, but this job would allow me to look at things from a bigger picture. I was really focused on Florida for a, all my career at Moat. And, and I, I just, there are no boundaries and everything in this world is connected. So to have the opportunity to look at the earth, the entire planet from afar, to understand how all these things are, are acting and how all these things combine. Did you know that sands from Africa, African sands come over by air currents and feed the Amazon and Florida red tide actually. Um, and, and did you know that 40% of the entire country drains to one area. And because of that, and because of our changing land use, we get the second largest dead zone or an area in the Gulf of Mexico with low to no oxygen. Everything in this world is connected. And this was, or is my opportunity to understand those systems and protect us long-term. So really quickly, I'm just gonna go through some of the lessons that I've learned. And, and I've said this before, diversity uh, results in versatility and effective results. The more diversity in your team, the more ideas, the more original ideas, unique, and the better off you'll be. Next, being persistent with pursuing your goals. I was, I was rejected from the University of Florida several times um, at different at different stages. And I ended up getting uh, all three of my degrees from there. But but with science, you really you have to be persistent because I mean, if it worked right away, someone would have already done it. Next, play to your strengths, know what you're good at and do it well. For example, I was struggling in a class and we had a final presentation and I know that I'm creative. So I, I, that's when I started rapping about science. I, my final presentation was a rap about activated carbon, which is a filter media, the stuff you find in a Brita filter. Um, and, uh, and I ended up getting a really good read in that class because of that, but always play to your strengths, know yourself, but challenge yourself at the same time. And so this, this, uh, video, Joe's going to send to you guys so you guys can see it later. Um, perception is reality. For me, when I was in kindergarten, well, before that, uh, I needed glasses at a very young age. I had really thick glasses and everybody just assumed that I was smart and I wanted to live up to that. So believing in people is just so important and, and becoming that. And also, you know, if you guys were in college, I would, I would give you other advice um, here, like, like getting into work before everybody else and leaving after everybody else and stuff like that. But that'll come later in life. Next, let your goals grow up and follow your passion. It's just because you want to be something when you grow up now 
don't let that change. Let that change as you experience the world and you learn and you grow. I mean, don't give up on on those passions and those goals just because, you know, business is easier than organic chemistry. But but allow yourself for that journey. And and this is the next thing, you know, like in in speaking about that, let it be a journey. You don't have to do something by a certain age. You're never too young, too old or too different to do anything. Never let that stop you from achieving your goals. Next, make your own luck. Prepare. Be a good person. Help volunteer. All of that stuff is so important in making the world a better place. Be kind and be open-minded. Listen to people. Next, go out of your comfort zone. And uh, Always go out of your comfort zone because if you if you're not going out of your comfort zone, you're not growing. If you're not uncomfortable, it means that you're doing the same thing that you've already always done. And in order to grow, you have to do things that you've never done before. No matter how scared you are, you just got to do it. And for me, uh, going out of my comfort zone was uh, joining joining the crew of MythBusters. My uh, my dad could barely work a toaster. I didn't come from parents that were scientists or engineers. And I had I really wasn't a builder until I was at Mythbusters. So it was a, it was a lot of pressure, but sometimes you got to throw yourself into the fire and take those kind of risks. Um, and the reason why I did Mythbusters is because my 11 year old cousin was obsessing over stars on TV that just want good role models. And I knew that it she needed a better role model. She needed someone on TV that looked like her, that can be a good example and can show her where she can go in life. And so that's why, that's why I took this. But here's a quick video. So science is really myth busting, isn't it? Instead of a myth, it's, it's a hypothesis. Wow, that did not work. There's so many possibilities when you actually go out of your comfort zone. There's no stereotype to science. Anybody can be a scientist or an engineer with some hard work and passion. I achieved this goal. I'm going to go to the next one now. I really hope that my successes will show everyone, especially women, that they can excel in science. That my journey will show that the path to every dream will come with obstacles, closed doors, and people that will tell you no. But those obstacles are just challenges. There's some C4 for every closed door, for every river you come to, there's a cardboard boat, for every doubter, there's an ejector seat, and for every no, there's an opportunity to rise above and be one step closer to your goal. You can achieve any dream, just don't give up. I can totally be in an action movie. I'm looking forward to going to save the world now. Okay, next, take risks and be resilient. If you do want to go into science, you have to understand the truth about science. The truth about science is that you're losing most of the time. Most things you're going to fail. And it was the same with Mythbusters too. 99% of the time you're going to fail. You can take a career where you win every day, just like knowing the code to win a game. And you can win that game every single day. Or you can go into a career where you're at a different board, a different game. You're doing something that you've never done every single day. But, but even though 99% of the time in science you're losing, that 1% of the time where you win, you have the opportunity to change the world. And that's what you have to do it for. And that has to drive you to get over all of those obstacles because you're if you go into science, if you go into engineering, you're not going to like all your classes. You might hate a few and you might think to yourself, well, this isn't for me because I don't like this. I don't like math, so I can't be a scientist. That's so far from the truth. You just got to get through those things to get to your goal. So this is, this is super important, as important as it is 
to inspire you guys to become scientists or engineers. It's so important to inspire you guys, no matter what career path. If our goal is to enhance scientific literacy and bring scientists and the public closer together, we need more nurses, truck drivers, hairdressers, estheticians, uh, lawyers, doctors. We need everybody to understand how the world works so that they can make actions and decisions in their everyday life towards sustainability so that they can educate those around them at the dinner table, at the hairdresser, wherever. It's so important that all of us understand our connection to each other and the earth. So as you go through life, and if you are going to stand up for what you believe in, make your message simple, connect people with, connect impacts with people, family or finances, give people achievable solutions and, and get people involved. And be exceptional. So do you guys have any questions? All right, Tracy. Thanks for that great presentation. I loved, you know, all of those tips. I particularly liked how you shared, you know, uh, the story where you didn't get into the university the first time, but you didn't give up. A lot of people might have, you know, uh, just turned back at that roadblock. But I think that's the most important thing you can do is learn from, uh, you know, failures or mistakes and come back even better prepared and, and ready to go after what you want. And then a big message we always share here is find a career that you're passionate about because if you're gonna do it for the rest of your life, it may as well not feel like work. It makes it so much better. So true. All right, excellent. So and and with the University of Florida, uh, they rejected me because I hadn't taken physics yet and I was a transfer student. Um, and that's another thing, you know, like where you choose to go to college, it's not your last choice that you ever make. You can always transfer. But I took my transcripts and I knocked on every door at the University of Florida until someone let me in. And it happened to be environmental engineering and that professor told me about it. And that's how I became an engineer. All right, perfect. You gotta go after what you want. Uh, okay, well, Classroom's turning in via uh, YouTube. Uh, use this opportunity to put in some questions and I'll work some of those in. But for now, let's start meeting some of our live classroom. So. I'm going to start off. I'm going to go to Mrs. Hicks' class. They are grade seven and eight, Hamilton, Ontario. We've got Miss Hicks representing her crew. Let's bring her in. Hi Miss there. Victoria. I'm good, thanks. How are you? Good. I, I wish you could see my students, but I don't really have a way of sharing. But they're all tuned in here virtually, and I know that they uh, absolutely appreciated your your message. I've got some questions coming in to the chat here, but it might take a couple of minutes. So uh, Tracy, that was fantastic. I really appreciated your message of perseverance and, and not giving up. And I guess my question to you is, what is the one experience that you had that you sort of look back and say, this failure shaped me? Gosh, that's, that is a great question because it's a, uh, it's kind of a culmination of failures and every single time you fail, it kind of changes your, your path just a little, little bit. But um, I think that, that probably the biggest failure, oh, wow, this is, this is a tough one because, it, because so many are coming to me. Uh, the biggest failure was probably that, that the series of communication failures through that, that water crisis. Um, but okay. So, so this is a fun failure kind of, um, and it did kind of shape where I was going with the project. So I was working with NASA to put aquaponic system into space for wastewater treatment. So basically we were using shrimp mussels and, um, and snails to clean wastewater. So that's um, when you poop and pee, you filter out the, the solids and then that water gets a pretreatment and then goes into this aquaponic system where these animals actually uptake nutrients and other pollutants and clean the water. Nah, there's a last, but anyway, complete fail the first time around. I mean, nothing worked. All the animals died. It was, it was awful. Um, and I, I learned really quickly, first of all, uh, how difficult it is to work in zero gravity with animals that are used to gravity. 
Um, and second of all, you know, the what we have here on, on land for wastewater treatment is not what will work in a sustainable small system. And I think that that understanding um, that difference really changed how I approached my projects from that point on, uh, if that makes sense. I know as soon as I, this is over, I'm going to think of like something that that was much better to say, but but that was kind of a really cool project. All right. Well, it's a great question to kick us off. Um, where should we go now? Let's go to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. We've got Mrs. Foster's class hanging out with us. Let's bring them in. How are we doing, everyone? Good, thank you. Uh, Hi. As a, as a female in the science field, have you ever had to overcome any obstacles? Yeah. Um, being a female uh, in in science and en especially engineering, um, at times it was difficult. I was the only female uh, on my team when I first graduated, um, and I was I was designing systems all around the world. It was a really cool projects, and sometimes I wouldn't even get invited to to baseball games. And and at the time, I thought it was funny because I was young. But now looking back, I realized that that wasn't wasn't right. Um, but but it's important to take your your individuality and use it for your benefit. So from there every job that I've had, I've really gone in, in two places that, that really saw me as being different as a good thing and an asset to their team. And, and it really has been. Um, and the thing is, some people, you just can't change their mind and you just don't belong there. Like, honestly, you cannot change everybody's mind. You can try, but if you try and you know, it's just not working and they don't appreciate your uniqueness, your difference, and they don't want to have the most diverse team to get the best outcome. Go somewhere that appreciates you because there are plenty, being a female has actually benefited me substantially throughout my career because I've used it as a weapon instead of, instead of letting it be something that holds me back. All right, another great question. I'm going to bring in Fakiro's crew there. She's representing her class in Mexico. How are we doing today? Hi, fine. Hi, Tracy. Hi. Well, we one question, and one of uh, the girls in my classroom um, asked, um, when you feel like giving up, like one of your experiments didn't um, go well or according to plan or your hypothesis, um, what kept going? Oh, gosh. So... I have this drive to accomplish goals, like really setting goals and and focusing on achieving them and getting over those obstacles. And then you realize that every single obstacle has made you better to achieve that goal. Um, so now it's it's really interesting because whenever something goes wrong, I realize that it was something that I didn't take into account that I should have and that I should know in order to, to achieve the goal. It's almost like I get excited when something goes wrong because I know that something amazing is going to happen and it's going to be better than I expected it to be in the first place. Um, so it really is, it's drive, it's perseverance, and it's, it's that passion. It's that passion to solve problems, to make people's lives better. Um, and the fact that, that I have, taken on projects that achieve that, um, that, that really keep me going to get over these obstacles. All right, I am gonna grab a couple questions off YouTube here. Um, one here, Mrs. Wu's uh, class in Texas, they're wondering, what was that project with the exploding boxes that you showed that went on Mythbusters? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. We were trying to paint a room with C4. So we, uh, <laughs> we developed something called a shape charge. So you have your paint. Okay, so we have four walls. We're trying to paint the entire room with one explosion. Okay, they didn't tell us until after the fact that we weren't supposed to blow down the walls. That happened for sure. But, but we were trying to take an explosive, 
and and paint and paint this room. So our idea was to use something called a shape charge, which it's kind of like a a hamburger, and we made ours look like a hamburger. Um, and it's and it's designed such that the blast would come down and then out. So we would spray paint from the ceiling to the floor all at once. And it worked, but we used a baseball size of C4, which was a big boom, too big, too big. Um, so so that's what, what that was. And, you know, now that you say that, I kind of regret not uh, putting some of my animal, the animal videos in there too, because I think, yeah, you guys would have had um, some cool questions about alligators and pythons, but next time for sure. We'll just have to host you again, Tracy, and we'll get yeah. some of that stuff in. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's visit Joe. Joe's joining us in Wisconsin. Let me bring Joe in here. Hey, Joe, how you doing? Hi. Good. Hi, Joe. Uh, what's your favorite part of your job? <sighs> That's a good question. I think that my favorite part of my job is actually working with interns, uh, working with kids that that are in college and just on the precipice of being amazing, of deciding what they wanna to do to make an impact in the world. And that's definitely my, my favorite part. Uh, so what I do with my interns is I make sure that they have three parts to their, to their summers. They build something because I, I feel strongly that everybody should learn how to build because when you build, you realize that you're not limited to what you see in the world. You can actually create the world that you want to see. So I make sure that they build. I make sure that they have communication aspect because it's so important to communicate science. And I also make sure that they they do their research. Um, but I, the couple summers ago, I let them come up with their own experiments and their own ideas, so that you know they can have something on their resume to put forward when they're looking for the job that they actually want. And so that was that was a whole bunch of failures when I talk about, you know, that, that whole summer was failures. Um, but it was a lot of fun. And the kids that I had, they're, they're super successful now. They're getting fellowships and scholarships and, and great jobs. Like, I'm so proud of them. But yeah, being a mentor is definitely my favorite part of my job. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Joe, for that great question. Uh, let's see. Georgetown, Ontario. We've got some great seven and eights hanging out with uh, Ms. Roman. Let me bring her into the call. Hey, Ms. Roman. Hi. Hi, Tracy. So lovely to Hi. be with you here. Um, I'm really sad my students aren't with me because they're huge environmental activists. I have a student Aww. who actually strikes for climate change every Friday. So wow. he's been in, in the local news and they're very passionate about that. And so they have a lot of questions around um, science and marrying, well, that with, they can hear. marrying that with um, their leader. Sorry, they're talking right now. Julia. I don't think so because we can hear um, them. But so we can't they're, hear they're trying to marry. Um, I don't think that she can. I can hear you I guys. I don't think that she can present. Guys, you need to be quiet. I can't hear. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, so they want to know about marrying career and science and like what, how to, so they're still pretty young, but they want to know like which direction do we go? How do we forge this career to marry activism and science? To marry, to marry what in science? Act activism. Sorry. So like being an oh, activism in science. It's okay. So this, that's a really good question. And it is such a fine line. And, and so I'm doing it all the time. Yesterday, I put a post out about the Keystone XL pipeline. And I, wow, that was, that was unexpected. Um, I didn't realize how charged people were about that. Um, mostly, you know, a post. Well, um, so let me, no one's ever asked me this before, but it is something that I deal with on a, on a daily basis. So the best, the best thing that I can say, and, and here's the thing, I've been on both sides of the activists. I've been, I've been walking right with them and they've been against me because, you know, they wanted to, 
that red tide bloom, they wanted to point the finger at one thing and it wasn't just one thing. I was communicating the actual science and the actual science didn't give anyone to blame. So there was no solution and I, I get it. Um, so it's really important that when you're fighting for a cause that you're educated about that cause, finding out all of it, finding out, it, be a lawyer, get get on both sides of that, see where the other side is coming from. That's that's so important and know your facts. And, and it's so hard to know all the facts about something that you're not an expert on. Red Tide, do it all day long. But the Keystone Pipeline, for example, was new. And I knew the environmental impacts. I knew the design because I, I was a design engineer. I did the optimization study on trucking versus piping. But but some sometimes people are just so passionate that it, it takes a strategy in order to get your point across and sticking with the science in those cases is, is always important. Um, so my, I guess overall, my advice is to stick to the science, use the science to be the platform for your opinion, but, but always make sure the science is there. All right, great advice. I'm gonna bring in Mr. Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck's representing some grade six, seven, and eight uh, from Chalk River, uh, Ontario, here in Canada. How are we doing today? Doing very well, thank you. I'm hoping that uh, you'll be able to hear Caden when he unmutes himself to ask a question here. So what was your most interesting part of your job that you think so far? I think I heard that. Hi, Caden. What was the most interesting part of my job so far? Oh gosh, that that is a tough one, right? Um, because literally everything that I do is so interesting. I I'm learning new things every single day, but I think that um, that aquaponics, that space, and that aquaponics uh, project in space was was super interesting and super exciting. But I think probably the most interesting was the research that I did for my dissertation. And, I, and that's really my soapbox. So basically what I did, so we have algae blooms and we have wildlife changes. Basically, you know, the earth, we have this water cycle that, that everybody depends on, okay? When we change the landscape, so in other words, when we put concrete on the land, um, that rainfall can no longer penetrate the ground like go into the groundwater and into the soil, it runs off pavement really fast. And so we're changing the natural water cycle. And that water, when it runs off really fast, it's at poor water quality. Um, it causes flooding, algae blooms, erosion. It causes ecosystem changes, a ton of problems. So my dissertation research and, and really what I'm passionate about was sustainable design like actually proposing a design to take an urban environment, so a, an area that's basically a city and using environmental engineering strategies to make it look like nothing's built on the land to restore the natural hydrology, um, if that makes sense. Basically to bring it back, keep rainfall where it is, treat water where it is, and um, allow for water to cycle as it did before we started building stuff on, on land. All right, uh, where do we have to go? Mr. Atkinson's crew in Simcoe County. Let's bring him in. There we go. How are we doing? Uh, Mr. Uh, hello, Tracy. Thank you uh, for all your uh, good, wise wisdom. Uh, Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I have my virtual class here um, in my basement. I might have a dog interrupt here or something, but uh, um, I have Nicholas here uh, who would like to ask a question. I'll unmute or you can unmute there, Nicholas, and ask your question. Okay. Uh, if temperatures continue rising, is it possible that the Great Lakes in, here in Canada could become like the Florida red tide? Oh, that's an excellent question. Okay, so that is, a, that is an absolute excellent question. So 
Florida red tide, Karenia brevis, it's, it's a marine species. So not that species, but remember that green paste that I was talking about, cyanobacteria? Well, some of those species, namely one called microcystis, is toxic and is sometimes in those blooms. So Lake Erie, which is one of the great lakes that's, I'm from Buffalo, New York, and, and that was our lake. And Lake Erie is pretty shallow. So, so it doesn't get the kind of deep water mixing like some of the bigger Great Lakes. So Lake Erie has a really, really bad cyanobacteria bloom or that green algae covering the water. And in fact, one year, a few years ago, um, the toxin that was released from that species got into the drinking water sources because Toledo, Ohio was using the Lake Erie water as their drinking water source. And so with climate change, there has been proven a correlation between these cyanobacteria blooms or, or green algae and, and temperature increases. With that, so the places that get a lot of rainfall will be getting more rainfall and places that are dry will likely get more drought, which is part of the reason we're seeing more frequent and intense wildfires. Um, that's many reasons there. Um, but so that means that in areas where, where you get rain, like where you are, you might be getting more rain. So that's more runoff, bringing more nutrients and feeding that cyanobacteria and allowing that to bloom. Plus they, they like warm water. Um, is So yes, the question is, will you get more algae? Yes, Florida red tide, no, but different species. All right, well, Tracy, this is great. You've been inspiring some awesome questions today. Um, yeah, they're great questions. That's great. Um, Tracy, are you okay to stick around for a few more questions? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, any classrooms? I know, you know, sometimes when we hit the 45, 50 minute mark that sometimes you have to duck off. Uh, so don't feel bad if you have to duck out. Thanks so much for joining us today. But we're going to keep things going a little longer because I know there's lots of questions still out there. I'm going to grab one from YouTube here. Um, where did that one go? Well, let's start with this one here. Uh, Beers Way would like to know what uh, are your degrees that you have? All three of my degrees are in environmental engineering from the great University of Florida. So I have a BS and ME and a PhD from the University of Florida in environmental engineering. And so for my master's, I didn't talk about this earlier, but I was a storm chaser, which was pretty cool. I was, I helped develop and was testing out a new filter media to remove nutrients or that, that stuff that causes algae blooms from the water that is running off our pavements. So it was pretty fun. Very cool. Uh, Steve is tuning in. Steve wants to know, you've talked a lot about what you love about your job. He's wondering if there's a least favorite part of your job. Oh, yeah, probably timesheets. I don't like doing timesheets. Um, no, I, I mean, it's always, it's always tough. Um, you know, like the, now at NOAA, I just started with NOAA recently, and I and I can't answer that question for that. But um, overall, I mean, it's tough failing. I mean, it's it's inspiring and it's motivating at the same time. But but trying to find time, actually, that's probably the big thing. Trying to find time to fit everything in, to mentor, to get reports done, to write proposals to um, actually do the research, research to write, you know, it's just trying to find time is probably the toughest part. And the fact that the work is never done, which is also motivating and inspiring, but at the same time, I can literally work 24 hours a day, seven days a week and still have more work to do because science builds on itself, but there's still so much that we don't know. And that's the beauty about science because you can really be an innovator and, and an inventor. But at the same time, it's never ending. Um, so I guess, I guess that's the hardest part is trying to prioritize and trying to guess what's going to be the best route forward um, for the amount of time that you have. 
All right, let's bring our crew in Alabama back in. Uh, hi, uh, what do you think the biggest impact humans have on the environment today? Oh, that is a loaded one, huh? Ah, uh, the biggest impact. Man, you know, like, here's the thing, like, pollution is such a, it's such a big, it's such a big topic because you have your microplastics, you have your industrial waste that's causing public health problems, you have your coal that, you know, the regulations on their filters now have been rolled back. So their filters only need to be like 1970s technology. You have you have fracking, which is impacting water quality and people like are turning on their faucets and, and but smell of gas is coming out. You have wildfires that, you know, it, between land management and, and climate change and human encroachment. Um, you have, it, oh gosh. So I think, you know, when you, when people talk about climate change, it's huge, right? And that's kind of your umbrella type thing. And, and, you know, you can talk about warmer temperatures, but it's not just warmer temperatures. Okay. So the more carbon that we have in our atmosphere, not only, you know, keeps the heat in or percentage, a very small percentage, but enough to change, to change the temperature, but also our oceans are sequestering that extra carbon. So it's trying to balance out and so the oceans are dropping in pH, which is causing problems for every anything that's made of calcium. So if you've ever taken vinegar on, on a limestone, like on a rock, and see it fizzle, um, a lot of our shellfish, for example, and our coral reefs are based on that calcium carbonate and, you know, are being really impacted by this, by this pH change. But in addition, what we're starting to realize is that our natural currents that we depend on to, for example, blue, blue tuna coming over from the Mediterranean to the East coast of the United States every year back and forth. And they're able to do that because of, because of the, the Gulf stream with climate change, those currents are weakening and we're already seeing ecosystem changes. And we know we're in the sixth mass extinction because of human activity. We know that deforestation is, is not only impacting, you know, the carbon in the atmosphere, but, but it also has the potential of uncovering more zoonotic pandemic viruses and, and the probability of more pandemics with climate change is increasing. So that is a loaded question. And I would say everything. Every, our impacts, you know, everybody, no one, no one can get out of the responsibility of making an impact on the world. And it's each of our choice, what kind of impact that's going to be. Um, so, so just because you asked that question, it sounds like you're, you know, you're really thinking about making, making positive impacts. I, I know that I, it wasn't just one answer. Um, but hopefully it kind of answered your question. <laughs> yeah, and I think it illustrates why a career, a STEM career like environment, environmental engineering could be so exciting for students, is it is a way to combat uh, what we're doing to our planet. Take good science and, and look for solutions, look for sustainable ways that we can still, um, you know, uh, build what we need, but do it in a way that's less, has less of an impact on, on our ecosystems and the environment in general. Uh, okay, let's check with Mrs. Hicks. Mrs. Hicks, uh, does your class have a question? Hi there, yeah, Aiden just had a question. He was wondering if you've ever had second thoughts or you were second guessing the your career path. Um, you know, I did second guess my career path. I absolutely did. So I went, after after undergrad, I started working as a project engineer. I was doing civil engineering design, designing water, wastewater, and stormwater systems all over the world and, and modeling these systems. But I, I wasn't passionate about it. You know, I was definitely working to live and not, not a balance of the two. 
Um, and so, and, and then on top of it, I realized that, you know, you go into engineering because you think it's going to be creative and you're going to be able to do all this cool stuff. But in land development in Florida, we were approaching every single project the exact same way to minimum regulations. And the client didn't want us to do anything different. I, I told them that I can save them time and money through sustainable design retrofit. And they were just like, nah, we know how long it's going to take. We know how much it's going to cost. I don't want to take any risks. And that's kind of how it was. And that's when I realized that I needed to do a change. I needed a change in career. So I went back to the University of Florida um, for, for my master's degree to prove that there was a better way. And, and so I went from project engineering to research scientist. And, and recently, um, you know, I, I guess it wasn't that I wasn't happy with my career at Moat, but, but I did make a huge change again. Uh, so you're never stuck. That's, that's basically what I want to say. You're never stuck and you should always look for, you know, the next, the next milestone on your journey. All right. Well, Tracy, I wish I could keep the questions going forever because I know there's still lots more out there. So to the classrooms who are tuning in, who didn't get a chance to ask their questions uh, on camera, uh, would you be okay, Tracy, if they sent me some, if I sent some your way? Oh yeah, of course. Okay. So uh, any of our awesome camera classrooms, if you do have more class or questions, uh, do email them to me and I'll make sure we get them to Tracy. Um, yeah, I'll send you a video of the answers back. Oh, even better. Awesome, Tracy. Um, there is one more question online that's kind of interesting. Mr. Hergot's class is tuning in and he's wondering if you know of any software or features on Google Earth where students could model things like algae blooms or, or flood lines. Do you know if there's anything that that's that's a really that's a that's an excellent question. So I think that there's some student versions of GIS, and that's that's what I would go with. Is it, I'm not I because I've had GIS, I don't use Google Earth for much except for distance measurements, just because it's fast and quick. Um, but I would say to start using those geo tools on um, on GIS and get, get student versions of that, um, which should be free. Yeah. Uh, and, and you can do all of that stuff. There's modeling in there and, and, you know, any questions with that stuff, please send them to me. Um, because yeah, I definitely, I definitely want to be involved. Okay. Awesome. Well, I want to start off with a huge shout out to our YouTube crew today. Thanks for sending in so many great questions, uh, and tuning in obviously a massive shout out to all of our camera classrooms, uh, both in the classroom and virtual. Thanks so much. Uh, for being with us with those awesome questions. And Tracy, that was a great, great, great event today. Thanks for sharing your passion with us. Thanks for sharing your advice with us uh, and hopefully inspiring a new generation of environmental engineers. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you so much. Oh, and I saw that somebody asked who my role model were, role models were growing up. I really didn't have any except my parents that were really hard workers. And I'm no genius. I'm a really hard worker. Um, but now as an adult, you know, Dr. Sylvia Earle, um, Catherine, uh, oh my gosh, my mind just blanked. She was, she's gone to space and she's gone deepest in the ocean. She was the director of, of, oh, of NOAA. Yes. Catherine Sullivan. Thank you. Yes. They are, they are two of my big role models now. All right. Very cool. Well, that's an important thing too. I remember growing up with David Attenborough, Jacques Cousteau, uh, and you know, that, ignited my passion for the ocean and you know what we're doing to our planet and sharing that with the next generation so role models are pretty important yes absolutely all right well tracy this is great i look forward to hosting you again in the future again shout out to all of our classrooms and i hope everybody has uh, an awesome weekend thanks everyone thanks everyone